Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about designing experiments. So let's go. So Ms. Gallus wants to use a beverage to test the effect of caffeine or the effect that caffeine can have on heart rate. Here's her initial plan. She is going to measure everyone's initial pulse rate. She's going to give each student some caffeine, Coca-Cola, wait for a specified amount of time, measure their final pulse rate, and then compare the final and initial rates. So what are some um, some problems with this plan? Okay, so some problems with this plan. Uh, what are other variables that will be sources of variability in pulse rates? So we don't know. So um, something we don't have anything to compare to. And that's called the control group. Okay, there's, there's, there's no control group. So there's no group where they don't have the stimulus, where they don't have the soda. And so uh, what else could go wrong? Well, you're given the soda and what is causing the effect that you're measuring? What is causing the raise in heart rate? Is it sugar? Is it caffeine? And so sugar... So sugar might um, affect pulse rate. And that is us controlling other variables or confounding variables. And if everybody's getting this caffeine, they might that, that might affect them in some way, right? So they, they might be thinking about it. They might start acting a little bit more hyper. And if they start to act a little bit more uh, hyper or hyped up, that might raise their pulse rate naturally. So... Uh, if people know they know they're getting caffeine, uh, it could be a placebo effect. Okay, it could be that placebo effect where they're, um, you know, thinking, "Oh, caffeine's supposed to hype me up," so. You know, I, I need to start acting a little bit crazier. Am I feeling crazier? Am I feeling like I'm, I'm more wild right now? And so that's where the concept of blinding comes in. And blinding is not letting someone know which of the two treatments they're receiving. All right. So let's um, design this experiment. The model that I'm going to do for you right now is a typical way to design an experiment. And so I'm going to point out to, to you some of the nuances that go into it. And it's going to help us work with problems where we have to design an experiment. So we want to design an experiment to affect uh, to test the effect that caffeine has uh, on heart rate. So let's let's design this. We're going to do this two ways. First, I'm going to describe it. So we're going to take the students, and we're going to randomly split them into two groups. Then we're going to give one group. regular Coke and one and the other caffeine free. How are we going to do this? We're going to compare change in heart rate. Seems simple enough. How do we design this? Well, so the design process is actually pretty smooth. What we're going to do is we're going to take uh, and we're going to do a completely randomized experiment. Okay, so this is a completely randomized experiment. We're going to take our 100 students and this is going to be a flow chart. And we are going to, by random assignment, and this is important that you have this step of random assignment here. You must have this statement in your experiment because that's what makes these, the, the experiment random and it makes it, uh, when you look at it, it, makes it more valid. And so 50 students are going to be assigned uh, to be group one. And 50 students 
are going to be group two. And then once we have those two groups randomly assigned, we are going to assign them to, um, two, to the two treatments. So uh, treatment one, So treatment one is going to be caffeine and uh, treatment two is going to be no caffeine. So by now the experiment is pretty much done. They've been split into the groups. They've been given a random assign. They randomly assigned to two groups there. You randomly assign which group gets uh, the treatment, so you flip a coin for group one, heads is caffeine, tails is no caffeine, they get caffeine. And then at the end, you're going to compare, change in heart rate. Key pieces that you have to have. You must have random assignment. So you must say at the very beginning, I'm taking the full group, I'm randomly assigned them. Uh, you must say that you have the two groups, then you must say, what the treatments are. So if there's two treatments or three treatments or four treatments, you have to say what they are and what group gets what. And then at the end, you must say that you're going to compare the change in heart rate or compare the effect of the variable or the effect of the treatments um, as you assign them. Okay, so that's the basic gist of creating this flow chart for designing an experiment. Let's break it down. Some of the terminology that we used in here. We talked about a control group. Okay, a control group is used to provide data uh, baseline data. for comparison. Okay, so what would happen what would happen if you did nothing? That's what that's, that's what uh, the question is there. Uh, blinding. So blinding is when subjects so that's a single blind is when the subjects don't know and or experimenters Uh, when the experimenters and the subjects don't know, that's called a double blind. Um, and we'll talk about why you might want to do that. Um, so the experimenters who interact with the subjects are unaware of what treatment was assigned. So imagine it like this. If I'm going up to a student and I know that they had that I, so in a single blind experiment, I'm handing them a cup of Coca-Cola or caffeine free Coca-Cola and they don't know which one they're getting. They drink it and we've already measured their initial heart rate and we measure their subsequent heart rate. A double blind experiment would be this. Someone else prepares all the cups. I don't know which cup is which. And that person who prepared them hands me the cup and then I hand it to the student. So I don't know if I'm giving them caffeine free or caffeinated Coca-Cola. They don't know if they're getting caffeine free or caffeinated cola. And what that does or what it can do in an experiment is it allows me not to kind of have that little smirk on my face, right? Where I'm like, oh, they're getting caffeine, here they go. Or, or oh, you know, like this one's probably not gonna have any effect. So I in no way can know and in no way can let the subject know what type of cola that they have. And so double blind experiments allow for the least amount of interaction that could lead to the subject knowing um, which one they got. And this is to kind of mitigate um, influence on the experiment or influence on the outcome based on what people know or don't know. There's a concept called the placebo effect. You may have heard of this. Where um, a fake treatment works. So if I tell you, hey, I've got these pills that make you super strong, uh, and if you take them, you can you know, do 20 pull-ups. 
oh, maybe you, you could do 20 pull-ups anyway. And I give you, you know, some, a sweet tart. And I'm like, oh, it's just a really sweet pill. And you think, oh man, I just took this strong pill. Watch me do all these pull-ups. And the placebo effect, I go out and do 20 pull-ups and I go, man, can I have some more of those pills? And I'm like, oh yeah, hey man, it was, it was just a sweet tart. And you're like, what? The placebo effect is when a fake treatment works. Famous example of this is in Space Jam, when they've got Mike's uh, Mike's special stuff in the water bottle, and it's really just water, but the the tunes think that it's something that gives Michael Jordan his power, um, so they think that it's going to help them, and so it does. That's the placebo effect. Let's talk about the four key principles. So four key principles of experiments. Okay. Four key principles of experiments. The first one is comparison. So you got to have two or more treatments. Two is random assignment. Okay, random assignment uh, is when you use a chance process to assign experimental units. So what that means is, you know, if I need to assign the hundred, the hundred students from my, uh, from my treat, from my group here into two groups. So I might uh, label them uh, one to a hundred. And then I use a random number generator, uh, one to a hundred. And I pick 50 of those numbers and they, uh, I assign to group one. So those 50 random numbers get assigned to group one, the rest get to group two. That is this random assignment of experimental units. Three, then I have to have a control. So the control is, it keeps all variables besides treatments uh, the constant. So keeps all variables except treatments except treatments constant. For example, I want to know what the effect of a certain a certain beverage is on the amount of push-ups that you can do. And so uh, what I might do is I might say, you know, this, so a person is in 70 degree, uh, 70 degree weather and they're doing push-ups, uh, you know, they're going to do push-ups after drinking this beverage. And then they're going to do it on a 90 degree day. Then they're going to do it on an 80 degree day. And so my, my control is going to be what the, the number of push-ups they can do on a normal day. Um, in those in those in those weathers in, in those weather patterns or or to simplify it if i'm going to give them this this drink that's supposed to make them be able to do more push-ups they're stronger or whatever how many push-ups could you do beforehand that's our control then after you take the beverage how many push-ups can you do kind of a thing uh the fourth key principle of an experiment is replication so using enough experimental units to distinguish difference So if I say, oh man, this beverage has the ability to double a person's number of push-ups that they can do, and I only tested one person, well, that's not really a reliable, that's not really going to be a reliable experiment because it only happened one time. So I've got to replicate that to be able to show that it is what it says it is. It does what it says it does. Okay. So we're going to design a little experiment down here and answer a couple questions about it. Again, with check your understanding, read the prompt, pause, try the questions, and then when you come back, and you can watch my explanation, you can correct what you did. But it's always best practice to try it on your own first because uh, there's sometimes a false sense of security that can come with watching someone do it. So make sure you try it and then come back and check your answer. So here we go. Many utility companies have introduced programs to encourage energy conservation among their customers. An electric company considers placing small digital displays in households to show current electricity use and what the cost would be 
if this continued for a month? Will, with it, will the displays reduce electricity use? <clears throat> One cheaper approach is to give customers a chart and information about monitoring their electricity from their outside meter. Would this method work almost as well? The company decides to conduct an experiment using 60 households to compare these two approaches, display and chart, with a group of customers who receive information about energy consumption but no help in monitoring electricity use. Explain why it is important to have a control group that didn't get the display or the chart. So this allows us to see or to show how much electricity could be saved So it allows us to see what their normal habits are. So given that they just have information, no additional monitoring tools or monitoring training, monitoring mechanisms, how much do they use? That's going to give us the baseline data. So describe how to randomly assign the treatments into 60 households. So uh, like I kind of outlined above, right? So we're going to label the 60 households. One, two, 60. Two, uh, we are going to use a random number generator from one to 60, and we're gonna pick 20 of those. And we're going to three assign those 20 to display. So that's the first one. So now we have 40 house, households left. So then we're going to two, uh, or the, the second. Then we're gonna label 40 houses, households. Forty. We're gonna use a random number generator to pick 20 of those. And we're going to assign to uh, chart uh, the remaining our control okay so you have to do two sets of random number generators there because we have three different groups so you randomly assign 20 pick another random 20 assign those and then the, the rest can be control group so what is the purpose of randomly assigning the treatments in this context so it creates random equal groups by balancing other variables. So by making it random, you don't necessarily just go and pick based on criteria that you may not even be aware that you're picking on. And so you're, you're eliminating that other criteria by saying, I'm just picking from the random pool, just 21, 20 average or 20 random numbers. All right. So let's create an outline. This is going to be our flow chart here. Let's keep in mind the key principles that we outlined above. So we need to talk about our group. We need to make random assignment. We need to have our groups outlined, our treatments outlined. And then at the end, we have to have that compare. Start with our total number. So 60 houses. And we need to say, random assignment. And our random assignment, that's what we just did right here. So if they ask you to say, how would you randomly assign it? You have to write out what you would actually do. So group one is 20 people. And the treatment is the display. Group two is 20 people and treatment two is the chart and group three is 20 people and treatment three is the control so they did so we did that we randomly assigned them to three different groups of 20 randomly assigned our treatments and then at the end 
we are going to compare and we have to say what we would compare. Compare, oops, compare electricity usage. Okay, that's all there is to it. So you must, when designing a completely randomized design, you must have random assignment at the beginning. You must talk about the three groups, how many people they have in each group, what the treatments are going to be, and then at the end, you must compare the electricity usage or whatever you're comparing in that given experiment. All right, guys? So that's the basics of experimental design, really focusing in on two things. One is, can you describe it, what you're doing? And two, can you make that flow chart? Uh, and the third kind of important thing that goes on here is when we talk about some of the, uh, excuse me, some of the factors that we need to, to keep in mind when we're designing experiments are what are what are the, the variables we might be blinding for and what are the variables we might be controlling for uh, and having that control 